When you are told who you are and that you must be free, furthermore that you must survive, you must go on living, and that becomes a kind of compulsion, you get mixed up. It's very simple. Of course you get mixed up. If you think you must do something, which will only be the thing required of you if you do it freely. These are the sort of influences then that cause human beings all over the world to feel isolated, to feel that they are centers of awareness locked up in bags of skin. Now this sensation of our identity can be shown and demonstrated to be false by some of the disciplines of our own science. When we describe a human being or any other living organism from a scientific point of view, all that means is that we're describing it carefully. We are going to describe very carefully what a human being is and what a human being does. All right. And we find that as we go on with that description, we can't describe the human being without describing the environment. We can't say what a human being is doing without also saying what the world around him is doing. Just imagine for a moment that you couldn't see anything up here except me. You couldn't see the curtains behind me, you couldn't see the stage, you couldn't see the microphone, you could only see me. That was all you could see. What would you be looking at? You wouldn't see me at all, because you wouldn't see my edges. And my edges are rather important for seeing me. <clears throat> my edges would be identical with the edge of your eyesight, with that vague oval curve, which is the field of vision. And what you would be looking at would be my necktie, my nose, my eyes, and so on, but you wouldn't see my edges. So you'd be confronted with a very strange monster and you wouldn't know it was a human being. Because to see me, you need to see my background. And therein lies a clue of which we are mostly ignorant. In Buddhist theory, the cause of our phony sense of identity is called avidya, and that means ignorance although it's better to pronounce it ignorance. The, having a, a, a deluded sense of identity is the result of ignoring certain things. So when you look at me, and I manage by behaving up here in a kind of a more or less interesting way, I cause you to ignore my background because I concentrate attention on me. Just like a conjurer, a stage magician, in order to perform his tricks, misdirects your attention. He talks to you about something he's doing here, and he talks to you about his fingers and how empty they are, and he can pull something out of his pocket in plain sight and you don't notice it. And so a magic happens. That's ignorance. Selective attention. Focusing your consciousness on one thing to the exclusion of many other things. So in this way, we concentrate on the things, the figures, and we ignore, we don't concentrate on the background. And so we come to think that the figure exists independently of the background. But actually, they go together. And they go together just as inseparably as backs go with fronts, as positives go with negatives, as ups go with downs, 
And as life goes with death, you can't separate it. So there's a sort of secret conspiracy between the figure and the background. They are really one, but they look different. They need each other, just as male needs female, and vice versa. But we are ordinarily completely unaware of this. So then, when the scientist starts paying attention to behavior of people and things carefully. He discovers that they go together, that the behavior of the organism is inseparable from the behavior of its environment. So you see, if I'm to describe what I am doing, what am I doing? Am I just waving my legs back and forth? No, I'm walking. And in order to speak about walking, you have to speak about the space in which I am walking, about the floor, about the direction, left or right, in relation to what kind of room, what kind of stage, what kind of situation. Because if, obviously, if there isn't a ground underneath me, I can't very well walk. So the description of what I am doing involves the description of the world. And so the, the biologist comes to say that what he is describing is no longer merely the organism and its behavior. He is describing a field which he now calls the organism hyphen environment. And that field is what the individual actually is. Now, this is very clearly recognized in all sorts of sciences. But the average individual, and indeed the average scientist, does not feel in a way that corresponds to his theory. He still feels as if he were a center of sensitivity locked up inside a bag of skin. The object of Buddhist discipline or methods of psychological training is, as it were, to turn that feeling inside out, to bring about a state of affairs in which the individual feels himself to be everything that there is, the whole cosmos focused, expressing itself here. And you as the whole cosmos expressing itself there and there and there and there and there and so on. That what, in other words, the reality of myself fundamentally is, not something inside my skin, but everything, and I mean everything, outside my skin. But doing what is my skin and inside it. I mean, imagine that every one of us, look, in the same way that the sea, when the ocean has a wave on it, the wave is not separate from the ocean, is it? Every wave on the ocean is the whole ocean waving. The ocean waves and it says, Yoo-hoo, I'm here, see? But I, do, I can wave all over the place. I can wave in many different ways. I can wave this way, go, and wave, wave, wave that way. So the ocean of being waves every one of us. And we are its waves. But the, the wave is fundamentally the ocean. Now, in that way, your sense of identity would be turned inside out. You wouldn't forget who you were. You wouldn't forget your name and address, your telephone number, your social security number, and what sort of role you're supposed to occupy in society. But you would know that this particular role that you play, this particular personality that you are, is superficial. And the real you 
is all that there is.